Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. It's very easy to start something, but not everybody finishes what they start. Matter of fact, I would say when it comes to spiritual goals, especially, probably a large majority of people never finish what they start. We get a prayer plan, we start, we don't finish. We get a Bible reading plan, we start, we don't finish. We get a good Christian book, we start, we don't finish. How many books do you have at home that you've started and How many Joyce Meyer books do you have at home that you've started and never finished? How many times do we buy a CD series or a DVD series and we have full intention of listening to it? Wouldn't have paid for it if you didn't, but you take it home, set it on the shelf, never get around to listening to it. So many people have a spiritual dream or a vision for their life, and yet very few actually finish. Paul said, that he was determined that he would finish his course. And that's always been very important to me that I finish what God has given me to do. But it's also important that we finish other things in our life. If you make a decision to clean your closet out, do it. If you make a decision to get out of debt, do it. If God's talking to you about your health and you know you have really bad health habits, you stay up too late, you decide you're going to start going to bed earlier, do it. If you decide you're going to change your eating habits, you need to lose some weight or you need to be healthier, then do it. We like quick fixes. We like instant gratification. But that's just simply not the way that God works. We sow. And then we reap. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. But I think we need to read it a little differently. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, lots of time, and more time, and more time than we want there to be. And then for those who don't quit in the middle, harvest. <laughs> Hallelujah. But actually, the Apostle Paul talked about the same thing that we're going to talk about. Why do I do the things I do? Beginning in verse 15 of Romans 7. He said, but I don't understand my own actions. I'm baffled, bewildered. I don't practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing that I hate, the very thing which my moral instinct condemns. Now, if I do habitually what is contrary to my desire, desire that means that I acknowledge and agree that, that the law is good, morally excellent, and I take sides with it. So he's saying that if I can't do what I know I should do, then really I'm kind of saying that I need some outward thing then to control me. The law was given under the old covenant to control people. But now we have something else to control us. The Holy Spirit living in us letting us know at all times what God approves of and what He condemns. However, it's no longer I that do the deed, but the sin principle which is at home in me and has possession of me. Now about 20 years ago, I tried to read this and it scrambled up my brain. I thought, well, if you're not doing it, then who is doing it? <laughs> Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I can't perform it. I have the intention and the urge to do what's right, but no power to carry it out. Now, the whole reason for that is because we try to do it our own and we don't depend on God. For I fail to practice the good deeds that I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I don't desire to do is what I'm ever doing. <laughs> now, if I do what I don't want to do, then it's no longer I doing it. It's not myself that acts, but the sin principle, <laughs> which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. So I find it to be a law or rule of action in my being that when I want to do what's right and good, evil is ever present in me and I'm unable to resist its insistent demands. Well, you have to read that probably about 5,000 times and have several people teach it to you before you finally get it. But this is the long and the short of what Paul is either just realizing or just beginning to teach the Romans, and it might have been a little bit of both. But 
He was saying, I see two things that work in me. Deep down inside of me, I have this desire to do what's right. There's a moral thing that's on the inside of me that wants to always do what's right. And there's not one of you who, for example, I mean, you want to finish what you start, don't, don't you? You don't start something thinking, well, I really don't want to finish this, but I think I'll just start it anyway. <laughs> just so I can fail and ha-ha, won't that be fun? You know? We, I mean, that's not why we start things. We start things because we really intend to finish them and, you know, feel good because we've accomplished a goal, but then we don't finish it. And so then at the end of the day, then we're disappointed with ourselves and discouraged. My gosh, I remember when I was a young housewife and I didn't understand any of these things. I didn't understand myself. And I was always a person that wanted to do everything. And I mean, I'd get up in the morning and start to make the bed. And then I'd think, well, I really should go load the dishwasher and start that. So I'd run out to the kitchen, load up the dishwasher. And then before I had that done, I'd have the drawers out, the door open. And then I'd think I need to run downstairs and get the freezer, get the meat out of the freezer for dinner. And so I'd leave the dishwasher open and run downstairs and get the meat out of the freezer. And then the phone would ring and somebody would want me to take them somewhere. And I'd leave and go off and take them somewhere. And, you know. I mean, by the end of the day, I was just an absolute mess, and nothing was done, and the house was a wreck, and somebody would say, what would you do all day? It's like, what do you, what do you mean, what did I do all day? I started 20 things, didn't finish anything, and then I just felt like a total failure. Paul said, I've got something good inside me, but then I've got this other thing. <laughs> in my flesh that just wars against every good thing. And Paul was actually talking about the very thing that I want to talk to you about, and that is the difference in your flesh and your spirit. And I want you to learn how to recognize when the flesh is operating, when the spirit's operating, and I want you to learn that you have to discipline yourself to make right choices. And that always means you're going to have a little momentary discomfort or maybe even a longer-term discomfort, but God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Not, not a rewarder of those who do one thing right, but a rewarder of those who are diligent about pressing in to do what's right over and over and over and over and over again until you get a right result. I want you to be determined. If God can do anything for anybody, God can do something for me. If God can give anybody a breakthrough, God can give me a breakthrough because His promises are for whosoever will. Not just whosoever will have the benefit of the promise, but whosoever will do the part that God asked them to do so He can give you the breakthrough that you desire. Amen? How many of you are tired of just hearing somebody preach about victory? You want to have it in your life. Okay. Well, you know what that's going to require? It's going to require you going home and doing what they preached. I can't really put it any simpler than that. I remember a woman who came to a conference that I did and She'd had a lot of trouble in her life. Part, part of the trouble was being abused. And this was a conference where we were serving meals. And she sat at the table with several other ladies. And they had a lot of conversation. And I did a lot of preaching. And by the end of the weekend, the girl made her way to me. And she said, I learned a great lesson this weekend. She said, as we sat at the table and talked, I realized... She said, I, I was so confused about why God hadn't set me free. I didn't understand why he had not set me free. And she said, I realized this weekend that everything that God had told all those other ladies to do, he also told me to do. The only difference was they did it and I didn't. So they were free and I wasn't. Do you have any idea how quick people would experience freedom if they would just simply do what God asked them to do? to do. But if he asks us to do something that's hard, we're always looking for an easier way. Now, why do people keep doing dumb stuff hoping they're going to get a different result? How many of you have been around the same mountain over and over and over and over, 
And surely you should know by now that you are not going to get a different result. I can't tell you how many days I wasted in the early years of my life being mad at my husband. It took me several years to realize it wasn't changing him one bit. <laughs> wasn't even making him unhappy. He'd just go and enjoy himself and I'd be the one that'd be miserable. The Bible says plainly, don't go to bed mad. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Yet over and over, I would go to bed angry. I knew what the Bible said, but I wasn't controlling my emotions. I wasn't willing to swallow my pride and do things God's way. And the only thing I got was no sleep, while Dave had a good night's sleep and sweet dreams. Well, finally, I got smart enough to say, you know what? This is just downright dumb. Why don't I just do things God's way? and see if that will work. So some of you have got some areas of your life that you're going to need to consecrate this weekend. It's going to be easier to say you'll do it in here than it will be to go home and do it. But I'm going to teach you, hopefully and prayerfully before the weekend's over, that the reward of God is so worth anything, that any price you have to pay to have peace, to have righteousness, to have joy, to have the satisfaction of knowing that you have finished what God has given you to do, to actually have self-respect and feel good about yourself and not be controlled by things. There's nothing that's better than that. Can anybody say amen? Yeah. You know, my daughter that's here with us this weekend over the last nine months has lost 50 pounds. And I am so proud of her. And God allowed me to encourage her along the way, and she had a goal when she started. She wanted to wear my clothes. <laughs> and now we wear the exact same size. Well, nine months of hard work, and I know you all want to know, well, what did she do? What did she do? What did she do? <laughs> you know what? I'm not even going to tell you. She did a program that's out there and available for lots of people. But you know what? I mean, there's another woman here, a friend of mine from the office. She's lost 60 pounds in nine months, and she did something different than her. What you got to do is learn how to hear from God yourself. Just because God anointed something for one person, that don't mean he's going to anoint it for you. You need to get your own word from God. You need to get your own plan from God, which he will give you. Because half of our problem is, is every, every time somebody else has got a victory, we want to know what they did to get it. And God's already told you what to do if you just do it. I'm preaching better than you're acting. Now, you know, it's real easy to commit on Sunday night when you're full. The problem comes Tuesday morning when your stomach's growling and you're so hungry you think you can't stand it. You know, the flesh is kind of crazy. When it's time to get up, it wants to stay in bed. When it's time to go to bed, it wants to stay up. <laughs> when are you going to learn that it's cooperating with the enemy trying to kill you? Your flesh is your body, and it's your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, and then your mouth gives expression to all of it. Your soul tells you what you want, what you think, and how you feel. It doesn't tell you anything about God. Your flesh tells you nothing about God. It just tells you what you want, what you think, what you feel, and your mouth is very willing to tell everybody, I want to think, I feel, I want to think, I feel, I think, I want, I want to think, I think, I want, I want to think, I feel, I feel, I think, I want, I feel. And that's called wilderness living. That's why the Israelites spent 40 years trying to make an 11-day trip. That wilderness journey represents staying in the soul. It's the baby Christianity stage. There are three stages to Christianity. The baby stage, the transition stage, which means that there's a change in your life to where you're not just serving God to get him to do something for you, but you make a complete turnaround, and now you come to God and say, God, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? And then you step in to a mature son or daughter of God, and that's when you begin to experience all the marvelous privileges of a child of God. As long as you're in the wilderness area, God's going to meet your needs. The Israelites didn't starve. 
Their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years, but honey, they didn't get any new ones. And I don't want to wear the same thing for 40 years. I like to shop. How many of you get my vision here tonight? Amen. So we've got some growing up to do. And I think it's extremely important. And this is not something somebody else can do for you. The flesh is a gambler. The flesh says, I'm going to do the wrong thing and hope I can get by with it. We were talking tonight about young people who get on drugs. And they were talking about some of the street drugs that are so available now and, and even just almost affordable for young people, which is really sad. And I said, why do young people, or anybody for that matter, just keep ruining their life with that kind of stuff? They've seen what's happened to other people. They've seen what it's done to their friends. Some of them, they've even seen what it's done to them and they've gotten clean and then go back and get on it again. Why do people do that? I can tell you, because they are thinking that just maybe they will be the one that will get by with it. I'll be the one that can do this and not get addicted. I'll be the one that control this. I'll be the one that can do it when I want to and then not do it when I don't want to. The flesh is a gambler. But the spirit man is an investor. The spirit man will do what's right up front for a long, 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 long time without getting any results at all because it knows that eventually payday is coming. Yeah. Amen? So Paul was basically just talking about the same kind of stuff that we go through. He was saying, why do I keep doing the things I don't want to do? I've got these two things, these two different conflicting desires, and they're at war with one another. And the bottom line comes down to, who's going to deliver us? Well, then Paul goes on, and in the last verse of that chapter, he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thank God, he will through Jesus Christ. So he knew that God was the only one that could deliver him but I think here's where we run into problems sometimes. We think that everything that God does is some whooshy, supernatural, miraculous, God does it all and we don't have to do anything. Yeah. Want me to tell you how God's going to deliver you? As you listen to him tell you what to do and you do it. Now I know that's not nearly as exciting as me coming in here and saying, oh, this is a night of miracles and I'm going to pray over everybody and you'll never have another problem. Yeah. But I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. I've only had one supernatural deliverance in all these years I've been serving God. And God divinely, supernaturally delivered me from chewing ice cubes. <laughs> I mean, I had a terrible habit of crunching ice all the time. I would eat it in the winter and just freeze. And when I started to preach and was getting around a few people, we'd be out with ministers and I'd be crunch, crunch. And Dave said, you know, Joyce, you got to do something about this. <laughs> and I tried to quit and I couldn't quit and I prayed and I mean, never want to do it again. So I'm glad I got to have that one supernatural deliverance. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know what one felt like because I'll tell you how God delivers me. Here's what I want you to do. I'll give you the grace to do it if you take my hand and don't look back. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be quick. But I promise you deliverance if you obey me. And then I would have to just sweat it out and sweat it out. God sovereignly delivered Dave from smoking cigarettes. Not me, man. I had to suffer. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why God has walked with me the way he's walked with me is so I can understand and help you. Now, we believe in miracles. I know that God is a miracle-working God. And hey, I will always go for the miracle if God will give it to me. And I hope you get a miracle. But if you don't, I want you to know what to do to still have the same kind of breakthrough that somebody else can have. Because I'll tell you a little secret. Miracles don't mature you.
So you might as well just quit wanting one all that bad and just say, God, I want you to set me free, and however you choose to do it, I know you'll choose the best path for me. I just used to not, I did not understand why all these people were getting all these miracles, and I was just like, I mean, having to gut out everything, and just, oh my God, oh my God. Down on the floor, holding onto the legs of the furniture, keeping to run away from God, and you know, just, oh my gosh. I didn't understand, and I spent a lot of time being confused, and, oh, God, you healed them, and I had to have an operation, and I don't understand, and God, don't you love me? But how many of you understand what I'm saying when I say that getting a sovereign miracle from God is, I mean, hey, that's a lot of fun. Whoa! <laughs> but it really doesn't help you grow up. You know how you get spiritual maturity? Going through with God in the midnight hour when there ain't nobody there. No pretty music. Nobody to cheer you up. It's when you say, I'm not going to quit and I'm not going to give up. I don't care how bad it hurts and I don't care how long it takes. I am going to finish what God has given me to do. Amen. Amen. Romans 8 verse 4. So that the righteous and the just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move, not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the Spirit. Well, why did you act that way? Well, because you were moving in the ways of the flesh. Our lives being governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Then verse 5 and 6 says some great things about the mind you can read on your own. But verse 9 then says, but, if you, are not but you are not living the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the Spirit if. Ah, I wish there were no ifs in the Bible. It's the ifs and the buts that just cause us problems. Yeah. You're not living the life of the Spirit if you're not being controlled, led, and guided by the Spirit. We think we're spiritual if our Bible's all underlined in three or four different colors. <laughs> and that doesn't mean anything. The only way that you really know if you're spiritual is if you're doing <laughs> what the Word says. Obviously, I'm issuing a call tonight for some greater things. Now, I'm going to show you what the flesh is like. The flesh gets started with a bang. <laughs> when I was studying for this, this is what God put on my heart. Get some of those 4th of July sparklers. Show people how the flesh is. <laughs> oh yeah, praise the Lord. Starting next Monday, we are going to get out of debt. <laughs> Can you go to the shopping mall and something's on sale? Amen. A woman promised her husband she'd stop shopping so they could get their bills paid off. She went out to the mall to pick something up. She saw a big, big sale sign in the window. Went in and tried on this dress and, oh, it looked so good on her. She just couldn't resist the temptation. She took it home and said, now, honey, you know, please don't get mad. As soon as he saw the bag, he was like, you, you promised me you were not, yeah, honey, please don't get mad. I just, it, it just looked so good on me. The devil was just tempting me and said, you got to get it. You got to get it. And he said, well, you should have just said, get thee behind me, devil. She said, I did. And he told me it looked better in the back than it did in the front. <laughs> Amen. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? 
Christian women going shopping, hiding stuff from their husbands. I mean, how are you expecting God to bless that? I mean, come on. Come on. It's time to grow up. I mean, the flesh gets started just like one of those July 4th sparklers. Oh, praise God. I'm going to work out three times a week. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get my house cleaned up. I'm going to get this place in order. Well, I pray that today's message has motivated you to follow through on what you start. You know, it's very easy to begin something, but it does take great courage to finish it. 